In this drawing, we're going to learn all about the saguaro cactus. You're going to need a regular pencil and some colored pencils, some light ones, not just green. We're going to do a diagram. You'll need like pink and orange and yellow and red and some things like that also. Now before we get started, here's a couple quick facts about the saguaro. I have listed a few facts right here under the title. The saguaro cactus grows in only one place on Earth, and that is in the Sonoran Desert. And Saguaro National Park is around the city of Tucson, Arizona. So the state of Arizona has a lot of saguaros. They can live to be up to 200 years old and be as tall as 50 feet, which is 15 meters. So that's taller than a house. And here we see a very old saguaro. This one is very big and has a lot of arms and this must be one of those 200 year old saguaros. Here's how they grow. They spend a lot of time being very small and no arms. And they really don't grow their first arm until they're something like 30 to 50, some people say as much as 75, but definitely over 30 years old. And they don't start to make flowers until they're about 50 years old also. So our saguaro here, it's a little bit shorter than it should be. It should be kind of taller if it's going to be this wide, a little bit taller. But I kind of shrunk it down like this to get it on the page. We're going to pretend our saguaro is old enough to have an arm because it's nice to have an arm that looks nice on our picture. So right here, there's two little lines. You see this blank space? So you can kind of make a curvy line like this. Let me zoom in a little bit so you can see. Put a nice little arm on ours. It can be any shape, kind of going off like this. It could be straight or curvy or however you want to make it. And let's put those lines on also. They all kind of converge to the center point up here. No matter where they start down here, they kind of go towards the center when they get to the top like that. And what these lines represent are these dark spaces right here. You can see better in here. These are sometimes called pleats. So you have these, these bumps, ridges, and then our lines will be the dark spaces where it goes in. And you can see these really well if we cut the cactus. You can see how these, we have these deep pleats in between the ridges. So to make them look deep, what we want to do is turn your pencil on the side. We're going to kind of shade, darken the crack, and then as you go up and down, you want to get lighter and lighter as I move away from the crack, make the pressure on your pencil lighter and lighter. See if you can make like that. You see how that starts to look 3D? Go up and down on the side if you can. And then lighter and lighter and lighter. If it looks like a stripe, you haven't made the transition gradual enough. It has to be very gradual so you can hardly even tell where the pencil is ending. Now this will be more difficult to do in colored pencil. That's why we're not really making this all green. Because the colored pencils really don't smear very well. With this one you can even use your finger. To help kind of smear it like that. And do we, as we go around the cactus, we're going to... Um, Keep the shading to the side towards the outside, sort of like that. See how I didn't, this middle one I shaded on both sides of this crack right here. And I think I'll, like this one also, I'll shade it on both sides. Because we can really see into this crack. From where we're standing, looking at the cactus, we can really see down into this crack pretty well. 
However, as we get closer to the edges here, you can really only see the shading on the one side. Now, I'm not going to do any more shading in this demo here. I'm going to leave it up to you. You can spend all the time you want to shading the rest of it. I'm just going to kind of get you started. So you can pause the video if you want to, or you can just come back later and go on with me and then come back later and work on it. But I'm going to show you how to add the, the needle texture. So the needles, if we look at this picture again, the needles all come off these little circular bumps like this. You'll, it looks like there's these little dots, like buttons, all down these um, rows like this. And then the needles come out of that. So, let's see if I focus in a little bit more. I suggest just making some circles like this on each one of these. And again, this will be a lot. I'm just going to get you started. And then you can finish it or leave it as you wish. So on each one of these circles then you're going to have needles, I'll start down here, like this going out from the center. You know, I never really stopped to look until I was preparing for this drawing. I really didn't know how the needles actually are arranged on a saguaro. But they're coming all coming out of these little discs. And of course the needles, or the spines, they are what would be the leaves. If this were a normal plant, not a desert plant, these would be the leaves. The cactus trunk itself here, it's actually a stem. The cactus is a stem, a green stem, and so the stem has to do the job that the leaves do in another plant. In other plants, the leaves are where photosynthesis happens. That's where their little cells take the sunlight and carbon dioxide and make sugars. But in a cactus, the spines, they don't, they're no good as leaves. So all the photosynthesis happens in the stem. Right, so, and then in the arm here, if you want to basically treat the arm the same kind of shade in the cracks and you can make some little spines although it might be easier with this just to kind of not worry about all those little circles and it wouldn't be quite as long and prickly the smaller branches I think their needles are a little bit smaller and softer so you might want to I just suggest, and then maybe you want to put a few coming off the edge like that, so it looks prickly on the edge. Maybe I'll do a few more over here. Okay, so then I'm going to go on and let you decide how many needles you want to put on your cactus. You can do the whole thing. Or if you want to just stop at that and, you know, we get the idea. We have a big enough patch here that we can see see how the, how the arrangement goes. So I'll let you decide that. And then down here, when you shade here, here's just a tip for those of you that really like to do artistic touches in your drawings. When you're working down here, after you shade these, like this, you see how I have this, looks like a piece of paper or a metal plate, or we don't really know what it is, stuck into the cactus. That's going to be our cut line. We're going to see what the inside looks like. But if this were really in the cactus, it would really there, there would also be a shadow underneath it. So you have like the shadows inside the cracks, but you would also have this this be shaded a little bit 
Now this is going to be a little bit harder to make it gradual. Underneath here, like this, and then get it a little more gradual. Lighter, lighter, lighter. This is going to be one where my finger comes in handy here. There. So right, it's the darkest right underneath that, and then it gets lighter. So you can see now it looks like that's kind of going in, but don't forget you got to do these also, like that. You have two shadows right here. You get two shadows, one from here and one from just being in the crack. Now let's find out what the inside of the cactus looks like. So you can see it looks like we've sliced into it and we're going to see what the inside is right over here. So you see how it's pointing? If we look at the end of the cactus now, in fact, I'll show you. This is one that was sliced already, and that's what it's going to look like. So you see these little dots here, that little ring of dots. That's this thing. And these things are what they call the ribs. And they're actually like things like this. They go up and down. It's a whole bunch of ribs going around like this. In fact, one of these pictures, you can see... The ribs, the cactus is died. It's kind of falling apart. Some chunks of it have already fallen on the ground. And these are the ribs right here showing. So the ribs are these long, skinny things that run all the way up down the inside. And they're woody. When they dry out, you can actually use them as firewood. If you're out in the desert and you want to build a little fire to stay warm at night, you find some of those saguaro ribs, you can actually use them as firewood. So here we go, you see it there and here, there's, those are the ribs. So this part right in here, this is where the water is stored, right here. So this, does, this never changes size, this stays the same all the time, the ribs and inside the ribs, this stays the same. But this part out here, it can get bigger and smaller. And I made a little paper model to show this. Right, so this is our cross section here. So the woody rib would be in the middle. And this shape, back out a little bit, the shape can stretch. Let me go back to this. So this shape can go like that or like that. Of course, the cactus doesn't have these problems that the paper does. So we're going to draw something like this around this one. And this is when the cactus is thirsty. There's not a lot of water out here and it gets much smaller. The cactus gets smaller like this. And then down here we're going to show it expanded. When the cactus sucks up water after a big rainstorm it can suck up water very very quickly. And this is how it does it with this accordion shape and it can swell like that and become very large and store the water. So that's what these two things are for. So on the top one here, let's draw some pumps that look like this. We'll pretend it's very thirsty. These Pleats get very close to the ribs, like that. So this is before it rains, before rain. And then, when it rains, and I have the arrow going back and forth because it can go bigger, smaller, bigger, smaller, bigger, smaller. And this way, after it rains down here, I suggest making a really light circle like this because it's kind of going to be hard to draw these V's and stay in a circle. So give yourself a guideline so you know where you're going here with this. Then make the V's very shallow like that. It's harder to do than it looks there. And then if you want to add some color, 
can see what the color is. It's very green right around the inside here of these. This is where all the green is. And then this part is kind of yellowy and white. So if you'd like to, you don't have to add color, but if you'd like to, you can go like that, make it green around the inside there. Kind of more yellow towards the, out, the green there. Just very light, don't make it too dark. Just a suggestion. And then if you really like to color and you want to do more coloring, you can always make these woody ribs kind of brown a little bit, put a little brown dot in or tan. You don't have to, but you can if you want to. And then it might be good to label what they are. Because you might wonder, looking at that later, what were those? Are those seeds or what? So down here on this one, we actually have enough space. We can label them the ribs. R-I-B-S, ribs. If you forget what it is, there's a note right there. It tells you what those pictures are. We call this an accordion shape because it reminds you of a one of the musical instruments called the accordion. It goes in and out and in and out. Kind of has these pleats in it. Speaking of rain, let's go down to the roots. Talk about that. Because that's how it takes in the water very quickly. So let's draw the ground level. Like this, draw the dirt going out, one side and the other. It can be straight or bumpy, maybe there's some rocks on it or something. And I put a note down here at the bottom that says, the saguaro has a shallow and wide root system that is perfect for gathering water quickly. Roots will go as wide as the saguaro is tall. So if our roots were going to be actually in scale, and a little bit more, I could measure, so the saguaro is about a little bit longer than my pencil, so that's how wide the roots will go. We'd have to draw them way over to here, off the page. So we're not going to be able to see all of the roots. But this is how it manages to gather up water so quickly. It's got lots and lots of shallow roots right there waiting for the rain. Now you can use your regular pencil or a brown, whatever, and first put a root down the center like this. One root. There's usually one root that goes a little deeper. These uh, shallow roots, they only go about as deep as your hand, maybe a little bit deeper, but you could dig them up very easily. They're very, very close to the surface. They do you sometimes have one that'll go down a foot or two, like, you know, maybe up to your knee or between your knee your thigh something like that long to help anchor it just a little bit but most of them stay shallow so I'm going to make my roots go out like this right underneath the surface like that and then there's lots of little side roots get smaller and this is very very important these little side roots they actually have side roots and those side roots have side roots and so on until you get to microscopic root hairs. And those microscopic root hairs, those are the ones that really suck in the water. So. Put a bunch of root things going off there and off the other side. Now some desert plants have the opposite strategy. They don't waste time with the surface. For example, a mesquite tree has very, very deep tap roots. It has roots so deep it can get all the way down 
into the water table, the water that never comes to the surface all the way down, we can tap into those underground sources, a very deep root. So a few plants do that, but a lot of them, especially the cactuses, they really have these shallow roots. Okay, it's kind of hard to draw the roots that are coming towards you. In our drawing, that's kind of difficult. So we just get some side roots like that. That's good. And I should go off the page over here, shouldn't I? Because it would go right off the page. Now let's go up here and find out what this thing is. In this box we have a microscopic view. So if you could imagine cutting this little piece right here, the box is where we've cut, and then putting under the microscope so we can like zoom in. So this arrow gets a lot bigger, which gives us the idea of zooming in on it. This is what you would see right here under the microscope. Now a real microscope picture would look something like this. Cells will look pretty blobby, or maybe like this. Here they've added some stain. They've made it blue and red. That's not in the natural color, of course. So what we find here is there's some little cells there. This is airspace. These cells, and over here, they're, cut, they're a little easier to see opened up. Right here and right here. There's little cells that create a hole called the stoma. So this is the hole here. This is airspace, right? Where I'm drawing with my pencil. This is all airspace. These are the cells. And this is airspace. And there'd be airspace, you can't really see it, but it's going down into here too. This is where the carbon dioxide can get in, which you need for photosynthesis. And this is where also water vapor can go in and out. Now during the day, you don't want water leaking out. You want to keep all the water in. And so these little cells have the ability to close the hole and then open it at night. So the way they do this, back out a little bit, they just kind of go like this on either side and they can, they can go like this. It's kind of like that. They can swell up and open it. So that's kind of how the cells work. And then we'll see that the photosynthesis is going on in these cells right here. And since this is a diagram, we're going to use colors like pink and orange and yellow to label our cells. We're not going to be realistic because realistically it would all be green and white. So let's start with the outside right here. So we're seeing, you know, it tipped this way. This is the outside going in. And we first noticed that there's a waxy coating on the outside called the cuticle. So right here at the top, you can see thick waxy layer called cuticle. And desert plants usually have a really thick cuticle. Most leaves have some thickness of cuticle, a little bit, but desert plants really, really have a lot. So I'm gonna make my cuticle, let's say yellow. You could make your cuticle a different color, whatever color you want to, as long as you color that box. Whatever color you choose, just color that box in and then color that part right there. And then these are the guard cells right here and here. I'm just going to make mine pink, not really pink, but in my diagram, pink will be okay. Right here. And here, so those are the cells that open and close that hole. If you can write, very, very tiny, you can write the word stoma, the name of the hole right here, S-T-O-M-A, stoma, like this, stoma, that's the hole. Or maybe you can point to it and you could write it along the side there. That's what the hole is called. You often hear the word stomata. They refer to the holes in general. They say the leaf stomata, and that just means all the holes. But this one hole is called stoma. So if this is the air right in here. 
So uh, let's put in the chloroplasts next and then do epidermis. So take a dark green if you have it. The bottom box says chloroplasts and they really are green. This is why plants are green. They have these little green dots, these little tiny things called chloroplasts inside. So if you can take a dark green, we can make little chloroplasts inside all of these. And this is the little organelle. They're inside a cell, so the things inside are called organelles. And there'd be lots of other organelles in here too. There'd be a nucleus and Golgi bodies and all kinds of cool little things. But these are the chloroplasts. And they really are green, and this is where photosynthesis happens. Now, as we get further away from the outside, we get further away from the sunlight, and so we're going to find fewer and fewer chloroplasts. Eventually, on the inside, why bother having chloroplasts? Because the light can't get to the inside of the cactus. Just the cells near the outside get the sunlight. So there's a special name for the cells that are really close. The first line under the cuticle there, they have a special name. They're the epidermis. And epi means outside and dermis means skin. So this is kind of like its outer layer of skin. So choose another color. Let's see, I'm going to use like a peachy color. You can use an orange or I don't know, whatever color. Make it light. Just light like this. Color this outer layer. We'll cover over the chloroplasts, but if you use a light color, you can still see the green chloroplasts. You can still see them. And make sure to do that box the same color. And then let's see, I'm going to, I'm going to use a very light green. You could use some other color. Let's um, do the other cells. Very light. Oops, there's a little bit of air space. You see, there are some air spaces in here. There. These are cells. There's a cell. Like that. Sometimes they call this the spongy layer because it's so full of holes. It's like a sponge. Spongy mesophyll is what they call it in the leaf. Here, we're going to use, this will be the, I think the hardest word we learn in this one. And you don't have to worry too much about this. But if you want to know what they're called, they're called the, right here, starts with the letter P, the parenchyma or parenchyma cells. And it's okay, you don't have to worry about learning that word, just so you know, they do have a word for it. Now let's go up here and let's finish the top. Like this. Finish this top with some buds and flowers. So you might want to just make a very a light guideline of where you're going to go with that, kind of like that. But you probably won't see it. We're going to cover over. You could make these lines go up a little bit towards the center. You'd always bring each line towards the center, like that. Just make them light. And then we're going to put some buds on, some small buds, medium-sized buds, and buds have opened to be a flower. And the best thing to do is show you a picture of these. In fact, I think we no, we looked at this picture very quickly, but we didn't look at the buds and flowers. Let's look at this one. The bud starts out small like this. This is the way it starts. This is just a very young one. It's not that it's going to stay smaller. And this one here, these have grown larger, gets taller and larger. So this is an older bud. And then right at the top there is where it's going to open up. So the flower here is, it used to look like that bud just maybe a day or two before. And now it's opened up. Now notice the texture here. If you want to add some texture to your buds, it's kind of like little upside down V's along there. See that? And I think this flower here, this looks like the one that's open the most. This is ready to have a bat or a bird come and pollinate it. Right here. Now let's look at a couple others. It shows you what the flower looks like from the top. It's a white flower with yellow center, and we're going to do a close-up of the flower in a minute. Uh, there's one. These are our, our but flowers that have wilted. They did their job and they've they've gotten all shriveled and dried, and then this is ready to grow into fruit. Alright, let's look at a few more buds up here. 
these kind of look like Brussels sprouts, don't they? But you can see that kind of upside down V shape. Again, it's a white flower with a yellow center. So let's add some of those. We'll talk about the flower more in a minute, but let's go ahead and add some of these. So a little bud, just make a little whoop, like a little kind of a light bulb or like a Brussels sprout shape. Make some of them bigger. And again, if you want to add texture, I'll show you like this. You can go a little upside down V's like that. That's pretty accurate for the texture. And then a couple of them I'm going to make like this, like a trumpet shape. And then make it ripply like that. And then ripply like that. And if you want to add a little yellow to the center, this will be that's what the pollen is. Upside down these. I'm going to shade one side so it kind of looks 3D also. So just make a bunch more of those. Maybe you want to make another look like it's opened. So make sure you have some in every stage. Some small buds, some taller buds, some open flowers. And here's a trick you can use if you want to make this look more real. So maybe I'll use this bud over here. If you watch, I'm going to put a bud behind this like this. But it's like covering. You see, I stopped. So it, part of the bud you can't see. And this makes it look like this bud is in front of that one. So that kind of adds some dimension. Like over here, I'll do it again. So make one like this that's kind of behind it. Like that. Because in the real one, you'd have a lot of them where you couldn't quite see the whole thing. So you can make a few. You can make a lot. It's up to you how many you make. You can even make one that's partly covering this flower too if you want to, like that. Go ahead. And so you'd have a little bud instead of needles at this place, instead of those little buttons. You'd have a bud coming off. So the buds, make sure they're right on these um, on these ridges here. That's where they are located, right on top of those ridges. And then when you have them all in, then you can fill in. If there's any place where you can still see that crack, you can kind of fill that in later. And you can add that. You might not even see that back line at all. It might be all filled up with buds. And then we're going to take a close-up look at one flower. So maybe this one right here, we can kind of point an arrow over from one of your flowers over to here. We're going to find out what the inside looks like. So let's see, the first thing, let's, let's draw the petals going out like this. And we'll draw the back, but not the front, because in this flower, we've cut the flower and we're looking at the inside like this. Somebody's done a diagram where they've cut the flower like that. So this is kind of what we're going to draw, hopefully. And let's, let's look at this picture all right there. So there's, there's the uh, flower. It's looking kind of blue, but they're really white. And here we have some bees in the flower. But what usually pollinates these flowers is long-nosed bats and doves. The bats come at night and then the doves come in the morning because these flowers, they only open for one day. They open in the evening, they're open all night, and they have a very strong smell so that the, the bats are attracted to them right away. 
And so the bat will come and stick its nose down in there and try to get nectar. And then the next morning, the doves will come or maybe some bees. And by the end of the day, the flower will start wilting. That'll be it. So let's see what the bats and birds and bees are doing inside of here. Well, the whole point of this flower is to make seeds. And of course, the seeds are like baby plants that are going to grow into a new cactus, hopefully. So, so the flower is going to use something called sexual reproduction. And that just means that it has a male part and a female part and the female parts the girl parts are down here you see this little circle right here it's like a long tube with a bulb at the end this little bulb at the end is called the ovary they use the same name in mammals if you looked into a mouse or an elephant or a human or anything else you call it an ovary and it has little eggs so let's make some little circles tiny little circles to be eggs now these aren't eggs like chicken eggs. They don't have a hard shell around them. These are like little blobs of goo, more like. And they're microscopic. You would not be able to see them if you opened the flower. We're making them big so we can see them. And there'd be hundreds of them in here. Little eggs. So we could label it over here if you want to draw a line. We put ovary with eggs. And the eggs are kind of like half of a baby plant. There's half the amount of DNA that you need to make a whole cell, to make a whole cactus. The other part, the male part, is going to be up here. Although, oddly enough, it usually doesn't happen that these come right down here. They have to go to another flower. But um, Before we draw the male parts, let's see. If you want to know what the tube has a name, the tube is called the, the uh, style, S-T-Y-L-E, just like, hey, I'm in style. But in botany, it means the tube, connecting tube that goes down here. And the top up here is called the, I'm going to write it over here. I'm going to point. You can write it where you want to. This top part is called the stigma. Stig, S-T-I-G-M-A, stigma. So this is what's going to collect the little sticky male cells. And then once the, once the little sticky male pollens get to here, they can move down the tube. It's kind of odd to think, but these little tiny cells, they can it's almost like swimming. They can move down the tube and come down and get to the eggs at the bottom. But they need some help getting from here to here. Although usually, like I said, it's not going to be from here to here. It's usually going to be from here to another flower's female part. So let's add some nectar first down here. Let's put some, use like, I don't know, yellow or a pink or something. The flower's nectar is located way down here in these little pockets. You can label it nectar. N-E-C. T A R nectar. So that's sweet. And the point is to try to attract some animals to come to the flower. So that's what the bats and the birds are after down there. So you can imagine to get it, they're going to have to go like this. Well, the bees could just crawl down, but like it's a good thing that the bat has a long nose. The only bat that can pollinate this flower is the long nosed bat. It has a long nose and a long tongue. And of course, some of the birds, like hummingbirds, have very long tongues too. They can get down into these deep flowers. So on the way down here, it's going to brush against these things that we're going to draw. These make some little sticks coming out here all over the inside. In fact, um, I'll show you. They're sort of like, whoop, can you see that? Like there. All right, you don't have to draw that many, but... little sticks, little filaments, and at the top of each one is a thing called an anther. I'm going to use a colored dot. You can use regular. I'm going to use colored because it sits up right at the top of each one. It's a little dot of anther, and that's where the pollen grains are. Pollen grains are very tiny. You have to have a microscope to see them, usually. Very, very tiny. 
and inside the pollen grain will be a male reproductive cell. Like that. Okay, so we'll just make a lot of we can kind of I'm making extra dots so you can these are the the dots on top of other lines. I'm not gonna make all the lines or it's gonna be like in this diagram, I think there's too many lines here. You don't have to make that many lines. See, I'm just making dot, 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 like that. But we get the idea. Just go like that, and that's fine. We get the idea. So these things are called stamens. S-T-A-M-E-N-S, -E just like it sounds, stamens. And so, it can put in parentheses, these are the male parts. It's easy to think that the eggs are the female, because we know hens lay eggs. But let's make sure we know the stamens, that's where... The male, and actually, we could write the word pollen too P O L L E N. That's where the pollen is. So, these now the orange dots aren't the pollen, they're the tops of these little stamens. So, the pollen would be microscopic. Now, you might think, oh, well, we just take some from here and then we just put it right there. It's a very short ride, it's maybe only you know, half an inch, a centimeter, something like that, to go from here to here. But in general, this doesn't happen. Um, maybe it does in some flowers, but, but mostly there is a chemical mechanism that will stop this from happening. Because the whole point here, the entire point of the flower and this kind of reproduction is to trade DNA with another plant. Hopefully, uh, not even just another flower on that cactus, hopefully the, that bat or that bird or that bee will have visited a lot of flowers all over, maybe an acre or two acres of different cactuses. And so it will bring some, as it, is it uh, here, as it does this, some of this stuff is going to stick to the body. It's going to be covered little grains accidentally. It doesn't really even know it. It's going to stick all over. And then when it goes to another flower, some of that from the previous flower might actually rub off on here. That's the goal, because you, you, what you want is to have male pollen cells from another plant. And so those other plants' pollen will stick here and then go down the tube to fertilize the eggs. And this is very healthy for a plant species to trade DNA with another plant. If it was using its own male and female, it would just be like a clone. It would have the same DNA. But you want to get some DNA from another plant. And so that DNA will be a little bit different, just a little bit. It's still DNA for a saguaro, but it's just enough different that maybe one of those plants will be a little bit better at surviving without water. or have It'll be a little bit better at photosynthesis or something like that. So you want to have those new traits being brought in. So this is about survival of the whole species. So once this happens then the flower is all done and this only takes a day and then the flower did its job and it starts to wither. As we saw in this picture the flowers just wither and die, shrivel and then this part right here, see where we have the dots and I have it labeled future fruit. This, this part will get bigger so the flower will get smaller and this part will grow and these have already started to grow. These already look bigger right here. And it's going to grow into a fruit. Here's some that have already started to swell. So it's getting bigger and bigger. And then it turns into a big fruit that turns red and ripe. And it'll split open. We can see one split open there with the seeds inside. So they split open this kind of like th one, two, three kind of pattern. But if you cut one open, you'd see more like that. Our picture is going to have a sliced one. It almost reminds you of a cross between a, I don't know, a papaya and a watermelon or something. It'll have a couple hundred seeds. Let's see, look, it's picture and another one growing. So, you know, this, this one and this one, they used to look like that just not too long ago. And those are broken open, and the whole point is the seeds spill out onto the ground and hopefully grow into a new cactus. So we're going to go over here to draw the fruit. This will be our fruit. And we're going to do the outside here and inside here. Like we've cut a little wedge out. So let's do our inside first. Our inside is going to be green along here. Like 
that. And now let's put a little bit of yellow. Like that. And then a little bit of red, but keep it kind of light. We're going to put some seeds over it. Just go with a light coating of red. And if you happen to have a black colored pencil, that works well. But you could use a regular pencil or you could use a marker, I guess. Put in a bunch of seeds. It really has a lot of seeds. You know, watermelons, the ones we get that are seedless, of course, that's that would be useless to a plant. The whole point is to make seeds. Well, so, but people don't like to eat the seeds, so they found ways to breed watermelons that don't produce so many seeds. But to a plant, that's kind of silly, because the whole point of the fruit is to make seeds. And so the sweet part around it, we like to eat. That's actually supposed to be food for the baby plant when it starts to grow. Okay, so what does the outside look like? Well, it looks green until it gets ripe. Let's make ours really ripe. So it's going to be red. Let me show you right here. There's a good ripe one. So it's kind of red with little white dots. Kind of reminds you of the little buttons over here, doesn't it? And it's like got little spiky buttons on it. So how about if we... Now, it's kind of hard to make it white on red. This will be a little bit tricky. But plan out where you're going to have a couple of dots white like this so you know where not to color. And then just try to color around them if you can. And if that's too difficult, don't worry about it. Can just make it red. I'm going to make the outside a little bit darker. Kind of make it look like shaded a little bit. And then on mine, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to make this a little bit darker right here along the edge, the part where there's the seeds there makes it look a little bit more. See how I just darken that a little bit? It makes it look like it's going in a little bit. And then I can even just make this just one side like that. Kind of stand out a little bit. Okay, good enough. And then that's the part where it attaches down there. Kind of greenish brownish. And then let's make the withered flower. So just make at the top there, make a little scruffly little thing that looks like a shriveled up little flower like that. There. We can even label that wilted flower. That's what that is. And then the last thing we're going to do is find out what happens to the seeds when the seed falls. Let's put a seed down here at the bottom, right here in this space, right on top of the dirt here. I'm going to put a couple seeds right here, like that. And most of the seeds are going to get eaten. Birds, ants, antelope, squirrels, there's a lot of animals that love to eat seeds. Most of them are going to get eaten. If a couple of seeds land, hopefully, underneath something protected, like right underneath the edge of another cactus or a rock, and they kind of get sheltered, they'll start to grow, but slowly. And then after a year, they're just going to be like this big. A whole year. We'll make it a little spiky. So there's a one-year-old saguaro, just that tiny. It says at two years old, it's going to be only about a centimeter. It's only not even as tall as your finger is wide. So this would be two years old. So so these would be actual size here. That's really how big they are right there. We could make it a little bit bigger. Maybe three to four years. 
takes so, so long to grow. Now, growing slowly is part of the saguaro's survival strategy. It grows very slowly because it doesn't need a lot of water. Water is key to plant growth. In fact, uh, if you want to grow a saguaro more quickly, you can give it more water. It's illegal to take saguaros out of the national forest and take them home and plant them in your yard. So what people do, like this person here, to landscape their front yard, see the house is back here, landscape their yard with desert plants. So what they do is they buy cactuses from commercial nurseries that have grown them from maybe from seed and they've given them a lot of extra water so that they grow very quickly. So these saguaros are not 100 or 200 years old. They're much younger than that. They're still maybe maybe 40 or 50 years old, possibly, but they're not 200 years old. So this is the way we can enjoy desert landscaping and also keep the national parks healthy. So there's your finished drawing. Like that.